When Putin announced the denazification of Ukraine on February 24th, Russian propaganda immediately took up the cause, explaining what it meant to the country, freeing our beloved Ukrainian brothers from fascist oppression represented by Zelensky. After it became clear in Moscow that victory was not imminent, the majority of Ukrainians were labeled as Nazis as well. It turned out that Nazism is a contagious disease. It seems that we're going to have to kill everyone, shrugged Margarita Simanyan. The phrases passive Nazism and Nazified masses of the population have come into common usage. The atrocities in Bucha, Irpin and Izum simultaneously did not happen and were inevitable consequences that could not have been dealt with differently. However, over the last month and a half, as the efforts targeting the Ukrainian energy grid, or the so-called energy terrorism, have intensified, Russian propaganda has moved to another level. No one is hiding their intentions anymore. Yes, we did bomb them, and we'll bomb them again. There is no more pity for Ukrainians, the brothers of yesterday. Those on television are mocking and laughing at their suffering, as you can see in this shocking news bulletin on the TV channel Russia. In Kiev and Dnipro, Odessa and Poltava, Kharkiv and Vinitsa, people are suffering with no heating or water, no means of communication, no hot food. And most importantly, it's funny. They're shaving at petrol stations. That's hilarious. They can't cook meat with any seasoning. Haha. <laughs> Let them cook something easier and healthier. Russia is getting ready to celebrate the new year and to live it up. Tangerines and Olivier salad, work gatherings and house parties, Christmas crackers and winter markets. Let the Ukrainians roam around in darkness. Everyone's joking and laughing. From the little known presenter of the Russia channel to Lavrov's press secretary Maria Zakharova and members of parliament. State Duma member Oleg Nilov jokes about missiles for Ukrainian children. Мальчик Вова из Киева мечтает о ракетах. Вова, ты получишь ракеты, жди. Это шутка, конечно, такая. The propagandist Krasovsky calls for the drowning and burning of Ukrainian children, which actually leads to Putin ordering him off the air. But the investigative committee ends up refusing to prosecute. The propagandist Solovyov mocks Zelensky. A Khlebuistin shouts, Gaida, in the Red Square. They behave like fools and jesters, madly pushing forward the idea of a people's war. But there's no irony or scorn in their jokes about missiles, death generators, or shaving at gas stations. To them, it's just funny. Watching other people's torment is hilarious. Social anthropologist Alexandra Arhipova reminds us that dark humor about the enemy is a well-known totalitarian device. It's a very specific characteristic. Dark humor used by the representatives of the state as a weapon, as a demonstration of power. It shows that they are aware of their opponent and are able to make fun of them. Paradoxically, or maybe not paradoxically, it is somewhat reminiscent of how comrade Stalin used Gossmech in the 1930s, where publicly mocking one's political opponent was a well-known form of expression. Unfortunately, there is nothing new under the sun. Dark humor, weaponized by the powerful in order to humiliate their opponents. Dark humor, weaponized by the powerful in order to humiliate their opponents. Two months of war is a long time. The longer the war lasts, the more its victims suffer, and the more morally degraded their aggressor becomes. The jokes and taunts the propaganda has turned to in recent weeks form part of the normalization of war and bombing from the inside of the screen. On one hand, the energy terror is still explained by military necessity. It is to prevent the supply of arms. On the other hand, propaganda insists on the explanation put forward by Putin's press secretary Peskov. It's just plain terrorism. When terrorists take hostages, they blame their enemies for their suffering. They should have just complied. This is what they get because they didn't. On the one hand, it's a sad sight, but on the other, it is quite legal, because Zelensky's stubbornness has taken this and other towns in the direction of a self-made energy catastrophe. In fact, the Kremlin may have now realized that neither its military nor political objectives can be achieved with a strategy. It's no longer about that. It's about the desire for revenge and about hatred and anger. 
That war that the Kremlin started on February 24th has been lost, and now violence becomes an end in itself, along with its propaganda chorus. They boast of bombing peaceful civilian targets from day one, and the tone of indifferent sarcasm with which Russian television talks about the war becomes the norm. In a recent poll, the Nevada Center has recorded the most negative attitude towards Ukraine since the war began. Only 20% of respondents have a positive response. 70% have a negative response. According to Denis Volkov, director of the Levada Center, this is not an expression of people's attitude towards Ukraine. It's the expression of people's attitude towards the Ukrainian leadership as mediated by propaganda. First of all, there is people's attitude towards Zelensky and Ukrainian officials, specifically the Ukrainian leaders that people see on TV where their sharp statements are often shown. People's attitude towards Ukrainians in general, however, remains positive, although we didn't have that question in our latest survey. In the summer, people still had a positive attitude, explaining that they were against the leadership that is under the influence of the United States, but that everyday people were suffering in Ukraine just like they suffer in Russia, while the governments can't come to an agreement. But how do people watching mocking reports of Ukrainians being tortured square it within themselves? After all, they see the suffering of ordinary people. It's easy to put yourself in their shoes. Can't you imagine all this happening in Moscow, instead of all the Christmas party and New Year's concerts? Let's say you believe that Zelensky is a fascist and that Russia has been attacked by NATO. How do you reconcile that with the snide reports of the people in Kiev and Odessa sitting in the cold and dark, unable to wash their faces or boil borscht? It seems to be through doublethink. If you don't want to believe the obvious, that your government is at fault, then you don't have to. I think people's thinking is somehow divided. Yes, there are some cities that are being bombed and there are Ukrainians who are suffering from who knows what. There's some sort of fracture where people separate themselves from what the military does. So I think there are very few people willing to admit the connection that Russia is doing this, that Russian forces are doing this, and that the people who are suffering are mostly regular Ukrainians not the Ukrainian leadership that Russians blame for the conflict. This is where the discontinuity is. Of course, not helped by Russian television. It all stays on different planes, and because this connection is not being made in public discourse, most people are not willing to admit this connection privately. It remains on different planes, and the pieces are not being put together. This is likely to be how people's defense mechanisms have worked in other historical circumstances. When a totalitarian government fosters hatred and aggression, society often plays a passive role. Yes, some people actively support what's happening, but others are frightened, others simply don't care, and the fourth group practices a kind of double-mindedness where they pretend not to understand what's happening. What is genocide? It is mass violence aimed at eradicating some national, ethnic or religious group. Genocide always follows the same formula. Researchers identify several unavoidable stages. It always starts with a division into us and them, our own and strangers. Then there is symbolization where outsiders somehow marked in order to distinguish them from other people. Putting yellow six-pointed stars on Jews, for example. Then there is discrimination, which is self-explanatory. At the end, there is annihilation, the genocide itself, followed by an in immediate, inevitable denial. It never happened, it's all untrue. But the most important stage of their journey after discrimination is dehumanization. And at this stage, it is the propagandists who take over. It is their task, it is their role. Alexandra Arkhipova explains how it works. Here we have to understand that actually killing someone is very difficult. Like if I try and hit you really hard, someone nearby would definitely react and try to stop me. We as people have a lot of mechanisms as a society to prevent violence and aggression. So allowing yourself to engage in physical aggression towards other people is actually a tough process. In order for it to occur, the people who the aggression is directed towards must cease to be humans in the eyes of the aggressor. In order for them to stop being human, they are dehumanized using rhetoric. There is a sort of verbal aggression. Again, there are lots of examples who can use. Again, there are lots of examples we can use. For example, Fidel Castro, the leader of Cuba, after the Cuban Revolution, called the opponents of the revolution who quickly fled the country to Miami afterwards, gusanos, meaning worms. In the 1990s, there was a horrific genocide in Rwanda, which was facilitated by the radio of a thousand hills. 
on which it was constantly repeated that the Tutsi people were not really people, that they killed their neighbors, that they raped women, steal livestock. It was constantly escalating. They first said that the Tutsi were not particularly honest, then they said they steal livestock, then that they deceived their neighbors, then that they raped women, then that they ate children. Eventually, this one and propagandists began to, began to call Tuxis cockroaches. Eventually, these Rwandan propagandists began to call Tutsis cockroaches. The extermination of the Tutsi people in Rwanda is probably the quickest and most violent genocide in history. There's no exact figures and never will be, but there were more than half a million killed in around three months. Radio of a Thousand Hills is the most well-known textbook story of direct propaganda involvement in genocide in recent memory. Dmitry Medvedev inadvertently quotes it when he talks about the cockroaches in Kiev on Telegram. As journalist Andrei Babitsky reminds us in his recent story, Radio of a Thousand Hills did not start the Tutsi genocide, for which behind-the-scenes preparation had been underway for years, but it did turn the genocide into a supposedly hilarious morning show. State radio stations in previous situations, though catering to the populations for the horror that was ahead, simply regurgitated the information that they were given. But Radio of a Thousand Hills was a different story altogether. On RTLM, or Radio of a Thousand Hills, they played modern music, joked, and took listener calls. The presenters spoke live about how they would smoke joints at roadblocks and talked in detail about the bodies of that Tutsi that they come across traveling across the countries. Translations of their broadcasts, easily available online, are striking in large part because of their shamelessness. That was their main innovation. Bybitsky reads quotes from their broadcast and, believe me, they're very similar to the Russia TV reports about Ukrainians drying their hair over the stove. Not by the literal content. In their Radio of a Thousand Hills programs, people are killed burned, cut into pieces, thrown into pits, but by the intonation. Just recently, in October, the trial of the founder of this radio station, Felicien Kabuga, began in The Hague. He had been in hiding for 23 years. Two years ago, he was finally caught. He's 18 years old, but there's a chance that he'll be sentenced in time. But it isn't just media figures who've been jailed for inciting genocide in Rwanda. In December 2002, Simon Bikindi, the most famous Rwanda singer at the time of the genocide, who had played at government rallies and whose songs calling for the murder of Tutsis and supposed Hutu infidels and traitors were played on the same radio station, received a 15-year prison sentence. The set a precedent of the first performer being convicted on such charges. At his trial, he argued that you cannot kill anyone with a song. His girlfriend that time, a Tutsi, said later that in reality, Bikindi hated no one, but was an opportunist. Whatever songs the government asked him to write, he wrote, these stories are all familiar. The exact same thing took place in Nazi Germany, for example. The physical annihilation of Jews was the final step, but it was preceded by a lengthy process of dehumanization using verbal aggression. They established a boundary between us and them and tried to show that they were not people. I now watch those segments of, look at how they dry their hair over the stove, isn't it hilarious? with horror, as it demonstrates this attempted dehumanization and show of superiority. Because talking about actual victories on the front is impossible, as they did not exist. So they have to brag about whatever they can think of while dehumanizing Ukrainians as some sort of object too by using some sort of old-fashioned survival methods don't live the correct way. This dark humor of the propagandists aims to prove and emphasize that Ukrainians are really themselves at fault for their current situation. Nazi propaganda famously depicted Jews as rats. Dehumanization through identification with parasites like rats and cockroaches is one notable approach. Another is dehumanization by portraying people as an infernal, otherworldly evil. This is what the intention is when propaganda accuses Ukrainians of being Nazis, in much the same way that Chechens were labeled terrorists when Putin started the second war in Chechnya. Terrorists, Nazis, are not human beings. Compassion and humanity do not apply to them. And this has happened before too. Before the Srebrenica massacre in 1995, Milosevic's propaganda portrayed the Bosnians living there as terrorists and invaders. Twelve years ago, in 2010, the International Criminal Court for Yugoslavia sentenced Milan Gvero, a former advisor to the Serbian army, essentially a political official, to five years in prison for his involvement in the Srebrenica genocide 
specifically for his role as a propagandist. He published a press release saying that the military was aiming to neutralize terrorists, not civilians, and made statements on television claiming that Muslim civilians in Srebrenica were not in any danger. Here's an excerpt from the court verdict. While the release of false information to the media and international authorities does not constitute a criminal act, the purpose of the release was not an innocent one, the verdict said. The only reasonable inference as to the goal behind this communique is that it was intended to mislead, in particular, the international authorities concerned with protecting the enclave, with a view to delaying any action on their part that might thwart the VRC's military efforts, it concluded. The number of civilians killed in Ukraine is in the thousands. From press reports and endless eyewitness testimonies, we know that war crimes in the form of torture and executions were committed under the banner of denazification in Bucha, Irpin, Izum and Kherson. For months now, both the Minister of Culture of Ukraine and multinational institutions have been talking about the cultural genocide of Ukraine. The Russian army has been deliberately destroying cultural heritage sites and setting itself the goal of essentially destroying Ukrainian identity. At the last meeting of the foreign ministers of the G7 on the joint investigation of war crimes in Ukraine, it was said that the systematic destruction of the Ukrainian energy system is also a war crime, and it is not a pursuit of military goals. These are all situations on which charges will be brought at a future tribunal. But this war has no end in sight, and this may not be an exhaustive list. Aggression, violence, bombs, death and destruction are becoming a national objective right before our eyes, and Russia has its own Simon Bikindis. Ten months is a long time, and Putin has no plans to stop. The entire time, his propaganda machine is peddling with all its might. Slavyov and Simonyan, Medvedev and Maria Zakharova, nameless news anchors, artists and talking heads in the Duma, endless experts and compassionate aunts who are brought to meetings with Putin, they are all constantly busy dehumanizing Ukrainians. According to the schedule, the next stage is the organization of the genocide. But everything's going a little out of order with Putin. There is a very famous experiment where people were put in an MRI machine and read a list of words, a text with a bunch of offensive epithets for various ethnic groups. Really horrible ones. On the reading, they were flare-ups in people's sections of the brain responsible for aggression. Another group was put in the machine and read the same text, with the slurs replaced with softer euphemisms. It was seen that a softer text corresponded to a lower degree of observed aggression, despite the similar content. There are many further experiments, such as Elizabeth Lofton's 1960 1976 experiment where participants were shown footage of two cars colliding and asked what speed the cars were traveling at when they at this point the researchers gave different participants were at this point the researchers gave different participants different words to describe what happened collided crashed touched hit each other and so on the stronger and more intense the word used to describe the action the higher the speed estimate by the participant the stronger and more intense the term used to describe the action the higher the speed estimate by their participant so word choice impacts our perception of reality and the extensive use of extraordinary verbal aggression and ridicule serves more and more to dehumanize others <laughs>